Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Deborah Henley. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Griffith Sciences, and I'm the hosting the evening tonight. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome you to our last impact lecture for the year. We've had four, and this is the second that we've had in this fantastic venue here in the Brisbane City Library. We're moving away from our traditional format a little bit tonight in that we've got two speakers. The first speaker is one of our academics from Griffith University, Dr. David Rowlands, who is the Deputy Director of Sports and Biomedical Engineering Lab that we call SABLE. He'll be speaking first. And then he'll be joined by um, Judd Armstrong from Jaybirds, who is actually a Griffith alumnus, so he's one of our team. But he's gone on to a fantastic career um, developing wear wear wearable sport technology that we'll hear a little bit about. So we'll hear from David about some of the basic science and some of the interesting things that are going on in the academic world, and from Jay, how that's actually been adapted to a commercial sense. So could I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we're meeting tonight and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge a whole range of uh, guests tonight from industry, from government and from research. We have people here from Cricket Australia, Queensland Academy of Sport, CSIRO, Brisbane City Council, Queensland Department of Transport and a number of my academic colleagues from Griffith. So welcome. I think, I'm sure this is going to be a fantastic night. And thank you for running the gauntlet of uh, the G20, which I, I gather has been a little bit disruptive in some of the streets around here. So the presentations tonight will, will run for about an hour. We'll leave some time at the end of that for questions. And then we've got some drinks and nibbly, so you'll have an opportunity to, to network, meet the speakers, and have a discussion about tonight. So Griffith Sciences, my faculty, is one of the four academic groups at Griffith University. It encompasses basic science, engineering, ICT, and environment, and hosts 12 research centres. So we do research from everything from sport technology, drug discovery, environmental management, quantum physics. So I have a fascinating job. I meet a whole lot of really interesting people, and I discover some great things every day. But part of my mission has been to share my world a little bit with the general public, and that's what this impact strategy has been all about. These guest lectures and our uh, quarterly impact magazine, so it's launched today, and I'm usually the first one to download the app, but I don't think I am today because I haven't done it yet. Um, the information that is there is about the, the app, and I hope you all take the time to read it. I think it's a fantastic resource, and it tells you a little bit about some of the really interesting research that's coming out of Griffith University. Um, We've got some discussion in this edition about what's going to happen to the Gold Coast after the Commonwealth Games, its legacy, 3D printed bicycles, um, an intriguing collaboration between an environmental scientist, a musician and an artist, which led to the Listening to the Thames project in, in London just recently. And in fact, you can hear some of the sounds from the underwater speakers that they put in, in the Thames. Um, so please download and, and let us know what you think. So. It gives me great pleasure to introduce as the first speaker tonight, Dr. David Rowlands. Um, David, as I mentioned, is, is uh, a senior lecturer in the School of Engineering at Griffith University and is also the Deputy Director of SABLE. David's been involved in sport and biomedical research for the last 10 years, with areas of interest including sports technology, biomedical technology, ubiquitous and wearable computing. His research, which we'll tell you about tonight, has been applied to a range of sports such as tennis, cricket, AFL, swimming, running, and soccer, and it enables him to monitor athletes with the purpose of developing training aids to improve performance. Great new world. Could you please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. David Rollins. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you and welcome to coming to the talk. My name is David Rollins. As Deborah has uh, read out my uh, areas of interest, I'm a Deputy Director for the Sable Labs, which are a group of, uh, which are a group of, um, sorry, excuse me for one second, which are a team of uh, students, PhD students, master's students, academics, full researchers, um, professors at Griffith University on the Nathan campus. We're well situated, we're sitting next to, um, basically adjacent to the old QE2 where the 1982 uh, Commonwealth Games was held. And that allows us to have a good collaboration with the Queensland Academy of Sport. And we've been with the Queensland Academy of Sport for a, a long time now. So, 
As you can see on the right here, there is a group of um, uh, companies, industries, universities, uh, sporting associations that we have worked with in the past. We have been spending at least the last 10 years working with a lot of these um, bodies in areas such as biomedical research, sporting research, basic human monitoring and um, activity monitoring. And as I said, we have a number of uh, PhD and Masters students. So, I thought I'd start this talk by giving an outline of where we are. I've kept it nice and brief. Okay, the first thing is, this talks about wearable technology. So what is wearable technology? So I'm going to give a definition of wearable technology, and particularly the wearable technology that we're aiming at, being part of the engineering school, the electronics school. Okay, I'm then going to talk about one of our areas of strength, which is actually using these sensors to monitor activity. In particular, using the activity um, sensors to monitor the activity of sport. Um, we will then look at some of the emerging trends that will occur. We can see um, particularly positive trends um, in the sports technology field and, and the technology field as well. So, in the beginning, there was the shoe. Sorry, there was the shoe, okay? And only the jocks wore the shoes, which is cool. They were happy with it, but then people discovered, hey, they're actually pretty cool. I want to set those. And so, the shoe has gone from the technology that's wearable into the mainstream. Same thing with the baseball cap. The baseball cap itself. People thought, oh yeah, only baseball are going to wear it. They want to keep the light out or the sun out. But then they started to get pretty cool. And they started to move, move across to the mainstream. And that's one thing that is happening with a lot of the sports technology that we're working with. They might start off in a sporting field, but they're starting to move across into the mainstream. So, what I want to define first is the wearable. Actually, I don't have to, it's pretty obvious. It's something that we can wear. Okay, it's got to be comfortable, it's got to be exciting, and for the company, it's got to um, ask for a lot of money. Okay, we are dealing in the electronics um, engineering discipline with the electronic side of things. So, what I wanted to show here was wearable technology, but with an emphasis on the electronic technology. Rather than an emphasis on the uh, making better bike frames or newer, smarter materials science, we're going to be dealing with the, sci uh, the science of the sensors, how we get the information from the sensors. Now, the interesting thing is there has been a huge convergence of all the technologies. A lot of what you see on this, on this guy here from the 80s is actually in there. We can see the camera, the video in the phone, the Walkman, the cassette type. I might have to talk to some of the younger people what a cassette was. Okay, but the cassette type plays the music in there. Recorder, video recording, in there. Calculator, in there. Dictionaries, and so on. It's all in there. So all that technology that existed is now converging. And the beauty of it converging into something, he says getting a prop out of his pocket, means that I can hold it, I can wear it. It's now become convenient. So this phone is very convenient for me. I can store my appointments in it. I can store other information in it. And it makes phone calls. So let's have a look at some examples of wearable technology in the markets. Okay, we have the uh, we have the bands and the uh, I'll talk about that one in a moment. We have the bands which are measuring your activity. We have a sporting uh, vest with a sensor in it. Those sensors with the um, uh, GPS are what's used by a lot of these sporting clubs to determine where people are on the field. And one thing they're very interested in is working out the workload. How hard has this person worked? So I can interchange them. 
or I can give them a rest, or I don't work them so hard that they injure themselves. In fact, as part of the uh, early part of the Sable Labs, years ago we were working with the CRC, which helped develop the systems for the catapult sensors. And a lot of those systems are worn by the major sporting clubs in football, that is uh, soccer, I should say rugby, soccer, AFL and so on. Okay, we have the phone. Wearable technology, we can hear it, we can run to our favourite music, we can run to our favourite beat, no problem. We have the RAIN activity tracker here from Jaybird and Judd, the CEO, is going to give us uh, a talk about that as a technology partner in there. We have wearable watches. We can get lap times and so on. We can also get heart rates. We can see, uh, have we worked in the zone and so on. And a little plug for our own little sensor unit. Okay, so what do all these things have in common? We're measuring activity with both of these. We're measuring location, workload, movement with these. We can measure location with the GPS in the phone. We can measure uh, forces, make it look like a pedometer, and so on. With the watches, we're measuring heart rate. With this unit, we're measuring uh, accelerometry, we're measuring accelerations, rotations, and so on. So basically, all these things are monitoring. And that's great, because it's now getting converged into our phones and everything like that. So our phones and a lot of our smart devices will have commonality under the hood. So that's what I want to talk about a little bit here. First of all, they're all reasonably smart devices. They have to keep track of something. So they're all going to have a small computer system under, underneath. Okay, they're going to have memory, they're going to have a CPU, all the stuff that we want. They need that to be able to control and to interface so we can communicate. They're going to have communication systems. They might have a USB connection that you can connect through to. They'll have a wireless connection, some of these. They will have Bluetooth connection, and connection, so that you can talk to your uh, treadmill as you're running and monitor. So, a lot of these devices are also going to have the communication systems. I'm going to concentrate a bit on the sensor side for the reason we have been concentrating in our research on taking the sensor data and extracting information from it. So, the first sensors I want to talk about will be the inertial sensors, accelerometers and gyroscopes. Basically, accelerometers allow us to measure g-force. So we're getting an idea of how fast something is accelerating forward, accelerating to the side, and accelerating up. I'm not going to jump. <laughs> OK? Wait till I get to gyroscopes. <laughs> With gyroscopes, we're measuring rotational motion. In other words, how fast we're rotating. Again, we can measure this in three different directions. We can measure rotation here, we can measure rotation here, and the other one's across the waist. No. <laughs> I'm not taking a time. <laughs> okay, so we can do our rotations. We can measure the rotation. And if you think about it, that defines a lot of our human movement. Our human movement is accelerations and rotations. Think about the cricket, the bowling. We have rotating arm to get through. So, our units of our accelerometers and our gyroscope can help us quantify and measure and get a feel for the type of activity that's happening, as well as the um, nuances of the activity that's occurring. There are also GPS. I've, I've lumped it under a sensor there. Strictly, it's not. But it's just giving us location. Magnetometer is basically like a compass, so it's giving us orientation. And in some cases, there's a barometer, which is basically giving us an idea of the altitude. So if we can see whether someone's gone up or gone down, particularly if they're doing um, activity like climbing uh, very large sets of stairs and things like that. So, the technology considerations we must have. First of all, if we're going to have a unit that people want, 
We're going to need to have a unit that has speed. We're going to have a processor that needs to keep up with the thing it's measuring. Okay? It needs to be able to analyse it. So we need the raw grunt, the raw power there. We need to have power. These devices are mobile. You're well familiar with the fact your phone's got a, a CPU in it of a certain speed and that the battery eventually wears out. If the battery lasted five hours, we'd be most upset. We want the battery to last a lot longer than just those times. So, as part of our hardware technology, we have to look for low power solutions. We have to look for where we can turn components off and on when they're not being used. And that happens a fair bit in our devices to extend the power. In, case, in some cases, they actually drop the speed of the device so that it will chill less power. They only kick it up when they need it. Software is very, very important. We can see, we can feel the hardware, but we interact with the software. Whether it be the operating system or whether it be the app. You're familiar with your phones, you can have apps to do all sorts of things. App for the phone call, app for your message, app to track your running and so on. So the apps and the feel of the apps are very, very important. The interfaces as well are very, very important. Basically, we've got to interact with one of these things or one of the devices, um, bands or whatever. We still have to interact. So that means we're going to be working with a human, okay? So these devices need to interface in a way that we feel comfortable with and in a way that's not going to scare us. We're not going to be presented with a 120-page manual just to turn it on. Okay? So we need to be able to have useful interfaces. Another part of the interface is the communication and so on. What interfaces do we need to get it to perform the action that it wants? Can we just log the data as we're running and then download it later? Or do we want to send it out immediately to our friends or get um, updates to our friends on Facebook to tell them how quick we've just run the last five Ks? Okay, so the interfaces are important and the implementation is important. I'm a great lover of technology, okay? I love technology, I love to play with it. However, technology for technology's sake is nice, but it's got to have an end goal, okay? If you don't have that end goal, people aren't going to be interested in the technology. So we must meet the needs of the user, okay? And that goes to keeping things as simple as possible. So basically, under the hood, these are just little computer systems with sensors attached to them, okay? Those sensors monitor the activity or monitor an external and supply a signal. We then have to analyze that signal and do something with it, okay? Our strength in the Sable Labs is that we have been working with sensors for years and we have been analysing that data and giving back that little bit of extra information. I can pretty much sum it up by, if you can measure it, you can improve it. Realistically, that gives us feedback. Okay? So, if I can measure it, I can tell somebody about it. So, it may be, yes, this is good, or no, you need to improve this, you need to walk those extra couple of hundred steps. Okay, or you're walking too slowly, you must speed it up. So, it's that interface, it's that feedback, which is where the sensors are very, very useful. So, we can monitor it, and then on our systems, show it. In the next slide, I'm going to be uh, presenting uh, a, a video from the Catalyst program. They came out to uh, do a program on our sensors and it gives a very good explanation of how these sensors can be used for measurement. An inertial sensor has two components, an accelerometer that records the body's linear acceleration and a gyroscope that records rotation. From these recordings, a body motion can be analysed in three dimensions. Vertically, medial laterally, or sideways, 
and anterior posteriorly, or forwards and backwards. Stride rate can also be worked out from these measurements. So we're about to go and have a look at the results, although I'm... Okay, we are about to look at some results. Not necessarily from that athlete, but from, from a runner. This red spot on the back is not just a back pain for this person, it's actually where we put the sensors. Okay, so we put the center of mass so we can detect the movement from the running. You saw from the video, we can detect in the vertical direction, and the vertical direction is given here. As they're going up, they're leaving the ground, they're coming back, and their feet are striking the ground, we can detect the ground impacts. So immediately, just from this signal here, we can detect how many strides they've taken. We can detect their stride rate. People can then work that further, and we can work that further into energy expenditures and that sort of thing. We can see the left and right, whether it was a left foot or a right foot, just through the sidewards motion, as you saw, moving across, and try to minimise that. And the forward surges, we can see where they're pushing forward, where they're accelerating. <coughs> and then of course decelerating when they hit the ground. So, that's an example of the type of signals that we get back from our sensors, um, particularly an uh, accelerometer. I'd like to show an example of a gyroscope. Remember the gyroscope is where we have rotational motion. Okay, here we're measuring the rotational motion of a swimmer. Okay, the forward direction is the X, out to the side is the Y, and basically straight out of the back is the Z direction. So these are rotational motions. So basically the hand is the direction. So if that's the X axis, the rotation is around the X axis. Okay, the Y is the rotation around the Y and the Z, I can't read around with that. Okay, so first thing I want to look at is what can we tell from the swimming? From the swimming, looking at the Y direction, which is coming through here, that's where they're pivoting over. So that's their turn. Good thing about swimming pools, they're a known size. Okay, you can't swim beyond the end without a headache. <laughs> okay, we know it's gonna take a certain amount of time and we can expect to see it. So we have those fixed parameters. Where they're doing their tumble turns, we can actually see a spike in the gyroscope. So it's quite clear to us that they're rotating. And that's good because now we can count the number of laps that they've done. But we want more, so we can look at stroke rate. One way we can do that is to look at the body roll, how the body is rolling around that <coughs> x-axis, so straight through my head, how I'm rotating like that. Okay, because when I'm doing my swimming strokes, and I apologize, the suit doesn't let me do it so well, okay, it allows me to rotate and rotate, and I can pick that up. And I'm sure you can all agree that that is the rotational motion across the body and you can pick up the strokes. So what can we tell now? Stroke rate. And this is good because it's hard for the swimmer to remember how many laps they've done, how many strokes they've performed. Okay, they've got to try and keep that plus keep an idea of their technique. Okay, and the Z one here is just pretty much the wallowing from side to side. So what I'd like to do, now that you've got an idea of the sort of things we can do with these sensors, I'd actually like to take you through some of the technology a little bit, as well as what we have been doing with some of the sports. Swimming itself is reasonably solitary. You're down, you're watching the black line, you're swimming back and forth. Your interaction pretty much is afterwards, unless someone can attract your attention during the time. Most pools aren't fully instrumented. Okay, so what we've been looking at is a way to instrument it using these inertial sensors. So you saw from the previous slide, we can start to pick up information about the swim. We can start to get, therefore derive more information from that uh, from that as well. So we applied a track mode, which is our one of our early units. It's a good point to actually talk a little bit about the technology. Okay, We have been in this game, as I said, for at least 10 years. 
During that time, the technology that's available to us to work with has changed. It's gone from a large unit that we could work with. I mean, this was designed uh, in-house. Inside, a lot of this is just the waterproof the casing. It went like a belt around the body. But with the technology that was in it at the time, and we're talking like 10 years ago, the technology was bigger. The battery required more, more power and so on. As the technology improved, it enabled us to reduce the size. We also had a learning phase, what we do need to include and what we don't need to include. So we threw out stuff that we didn't need. Okay. And we could reduce it further until finally we get to our Sable Sense unit. Now this unit isn't the smallest. Oh, thank you very much. The Sable Sense unit. I wasn't sure whether people could see it. Okay. It's not the smallest unit, but this one is designed to be uh, a research unit. So it's flexible, we can plug other systems into it. So we can plug boards into it for communications and so on. All right, so we've tried to keep this versatile because we're looking at many different sports, many, many different activities in the laboratory. You can make things a lot smaller than that, but you're heading towards a dedicated. And you'll see a good example with the um, J-Bird. So I thought it, would, it was a good opportunity to tell you that technology is changing all the time. We are taking advantage of that, but we're value adding. The value add is the information we're pulling out of the signals, okay? And that will be crucial. We can do more. So, these are getting better, measure faster, we can start to pull more information. Okay, leading to our stable sense, of which there are brochures over there. But we must have a bit of an ecosystem with it as well. We can't just have, well, here's the hardware, push the button, see you next week. That just doesn't work. So what we need to provide is software to do help with analysis, and we provide a MATLAB toolkit with that. We also provide GUIs as part of that, so you can watch signals and watch the video play. So as the video is playing, Okay, you can see the signals at that same time that you're measuring pass under, which is really good to help us analyse what is going on. So really, you need an ecosystem with it. Hardware by itself just doesn't cut it. Um, example, software has been targeted for swimming. You can see the strokes marked in yellow. Over here we have our lap times, which give you lap time, stroke count, stroke rate, your 100 metre time and so on. We can put multiple sensors on the body and we can get different traces for each of those sensors so we can see how they're working when they're synchronised. So we can see what the legs are doing, we can see what the wrist is doing and so on. And as you can see, they're quite different signatures for different parts of the body, although they're the same body. Just as an aside, to show you something a little bit extra about the value add, here is a signature from an elite swimmer and sorry, an elite swimmer and an experienced swimmer. We've overlapped the uh, strokes in the swimming, and we can instantly pick up that the elite swimmer is a lot more mechanical than the experienced swimmer. So they're repeating the same actions over and over. One would think a lot more efficiently as well. So just by getting the data, we can start to see that. And if there's any factors that are affecting them, okay, we should be able to see that occur in there as well. We've done some work with cricket, instrumenting up bats, looking at the bowling action. Okay, you can see an early version there. One thing we have been working with, we've uh, worked with the ICC to pick up illegal bowling action. I'm going to discuss that uh, in a moment. But typically, a lot of sensor work is done in a laboratory. Okay? One of the good things about the sensor is that we can take it out of the lab session. So, here we have, and this is testing up for the cricket, for the cricket bowling here. We have a camera system, a Vicon, 
I'm not sure that everybody is familiar with that, but the Viacom is the same sort of system that they used for the CGI for a lot of the um, animations. So basically, you put reflective markers that you can see here, and you can see around there on the body. The cameras pick up the reflections from those markers. If you've got enough cameras, you can pinpoint whereabouts in space that marker is. Okay? So, if you want to do this for um, a sprinter, you might have to have 100 metres worth of these cameras spaced far enough that you can see the volume. Okay? This is where an inertial sensor will come in very handy. To show you a typical output for a bowler, okay, each one of these correspond to one of the markers on the body. We want to see which markers correspond to around the wrist and arms for the bowling, and we can follow their track like that. So we can do that using a Vicon system. There is a lot of analysis under the hood that's required to do that. Okay, it's quite detailed. You have to do a lot of extraction, and this is only showing it at a couple of time points, as opposed to the whole long time. One thing that we have proposed is to detect a bowling action, but use two sensors. Basically, for a legal bowling action, you're going to need to have the arms straight up near the delivery. So, one would say that if both of the units are in a straight line, that it's straight, okay, then the outputs are going to track. They're going to match each other. If there is a difference, as you can see here, then the outputs aren't going to track each other. So, we can use that to see about the bowling action. Okay, a couple of quick examples. Here, on this side, are illegal bowling action, even though this guy was trying to bowl illegally and couldn't do it. Good thing to know. Okay, but basically, you can see that the patterns are pretty much tracking. Okay? With these, the two is marking the illegal action. We can see that the patterns don't track. Okay, so that means there is a difference in the angle between the um, arm. We've worked with rowing. Okay, although this was not uh, instrumenting people, we actually instrumented the boats many years ago. It was used in competition. Sample output, we can see the velocity. We can see the example of the stroke rate. So basically, they put the pedal to the metal at the beginning, eased into the race, and then went, went like a um, scared bat at the end. Okay, so they really worked as hard as they could at the end there. Okay, we can also track position. And this has been used for quite a while, and they're actually very quite happy with the outcomes of that. We've applied it to snowboarding. In fact, the snowboarding was one of the events, or one of the units, was used for automatic scoring. Because in the snowboard, particularly with the half pipe, we're looking at the hang time, we're looking at the aerial maneuvers. So we can detect it. We can see how long it was in the air, because the uh, gravitational from the accelerometers will be zero. Okay, so we can see how long they're in the air, we can detect what um, activities they've done. And they've been able to use that for scoring. And I also think it's pretty cool. The PhD student who did that got to follow the snowboarding team around. He hated it. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to look at skydiving. Basically, on the centre of mass. I've got to admit, if I'm going to jump out of a plane, my stomach will be that colour too. Okay, but basically, they're being scored by looking through a uh, long lens. We have the jump out of the plane, high acceleration, free falling. That's where they're doing their activities, and thankfully it opens. I assume if it doesn't, it's going to be much bigger. <laughs> okay, so we can detect about the skydiving. And another one that is interesting, I'm going back to the running, is that uh, we have done work in the lab looking at using inertial sensors to cover similar things as the GPS. For example, we we're looking, in this case, at looking at the athlete's running speed. Oops, my 
apologies, looking at the athlete's running speed, and we can see that it matched the GPS very well. But this is the running speed determined from an inertial sensor unit. The beauty of this is, with the GPS, as you're all aware, you've driven into a car park, it goes lost satellites, and wants you to do something. Okay? With the inertial sensor unit that we have, we're not using the GPS, so we don't have to have the satellites there. So we can run it inside once we've trained it for the athlete. Okay? So, there's a lot of benefits to the inertial sensors that we're using. I should kick over at this stage to the health side because in the health side what we're doing is monitoring human activity. In sport we're monitoring human activity. So as part of the Sable Labs we've actually worked on uh, systems where we use inertial sensors to classify activity that then gets sent up to a database where a health professional can track the activity for rehabilitation purposes or just general health purposes, okay? And also the user can track it. Different stakeholders require different outputs. So both outputs from both of those will be different because the health professional is looking for something else other than compliance. One of the issues that we have in any of these healthy activity type things is the issue of compliance, okay? People will fill in a diary for a little while, but after that time, they tend to work on memory. Oh yeah, oh, okay. oh yeah, I think I did this, I think I did that. And interestingly, the people who haven't done much of the work that they're supposed to have done tend to over-report, and the people that zealously did all the work tend to under-report. So automating the process is a very useful thing to do. In, in the time that's left to me about uh, the emerging trends. You've already seen from our swimming technology that we're able to achieve more with it, reduce the size, make it last longer because technology has improved. Okay? That means as technology improves, we're going to improve what we can do but we still have to analyse the data and be smart with the analysis of the data. The other advantage of the uh, technology improvement down to the lowest level, okay, basically means that we can extract more. We have more grunt to work with. We know things are going to last longer. We can have better measurements, higher rate measurements, and so on. There's going to be an opportunity in terms of the human face. We have to interface, we have to provide feedback, okay? Because a phone or an app by itself, if it doesn't give you information about what it's measured, might as well not be there. Okay, so it's very important that we can measure that and there's lots of opportunities working with elite sport and one benefits of working with elite sport is the technology developed there can also move down to the grassroots. Think about Formula One and all the technology developed there has eventually moved through the stream. Okay. Interesting figure, I've highlighted it in red. Basically, uh, Kearney said in 2011 that the sports industry is worth 620 billion worthwhile. What, sorry, worthwhile, it certainly is. Worldwide. Okay, basically, it's an area that's untapped, but it's becoming more and more uh, accessed. And this was 2011. Things have certainly kicked on a lot more since then. It's moving the elite to consumer, particularly since a lot of us will not be parted with our smart devices and our bands and our monitoring units and our heart weights and our watches and so on. There's been a rapid development of leisure products Okay, we're now looking towards, as a consumer, more leisure items. Again, the, the uh, sand shoe, the sport shoe, moving mainstream. So we're starting to look at a lot of these, and as they become more affordable for us, uh, as the uh, common people, then we find it much more affordable, and we can start to use it, and, and really start to enjoy it and get the benefits. And I've been pushing 
a topic where I'm talking about convergent technologies. Everything's coming together. We have all these things, whether we have the sensors external, they can talk to your phone. They can then go up to a cloud so you can compete with your mates, you can stream, all that sort of stuff. So the convergent technologies is still gonna be dragging in more and more things and there's lots of opportunity there for us. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the technologies, improvement, convergence, and so on. So just to give you a quick idea, Moore's Law, the number of transistors per square inch doubles every two years. Basically what that's saying is the components inside your standard processor is getting smaller in size, means you can pack more in. If you can pack more in, you can do more stuff. Okay? There was also a benefit for speed as well. The other advantage okay, is the cost. The cost is starting to decrease for the number of transistors that we've got. So we can start to see that things can reduce in price as well. And of course, once it hits the appropriate points and power, that's where people can get interested. Uh, looking at uh, some predictions with the Bluetooth, here we are here, sitting around 2014. In 2018, the predictions are sitting up here. So the Bluetooth will allow you to communicate with your other devices, and oops, my apologies, and in the healthcare, we can see the same thing as well. Here we are, and there we have our communications. So, what does that say? There's going to be a huge explosion in our not only our number of devices to be able to match those curves, there's also going to be a huge explosion in the communication technologies with it. The flip side to that is that if you're going to be communicating, you've got to communicate with something and you've got to store it somewhere and you want to look at it. So the data appetite is going to improve. Okay, so again, looking at the figures, we can see that there is an increase in the requirement for the data. So there's going to be 12 times, according to Ericsson, 12 times the mobile traffic in 2018 than there was in 2012. Some other technologies that are coming up and convergent as well. The cloud, some predictions, US billion dollars from 109 to 206. Okay, embedded systems, the sort of thing that sits in your fridge and your microwave, they're all getting smarter. Okay, mobile phone shipments, in fact I actually think it's reached that shipment already. Okay, and this number here for the augmented reality, I think that's a little bit optimistic, <coughs> but the technology is there, we can start to see um, the devices appearing on the market already. So to sort of summarise that, smart device use will increase eightfold, health and fitness they're predicting is going to increase 30 times. You want to think about the smart devices, how many devices have you got? I was actually quite surprised the other day, I was looking through the numbers and went, yeah, okay, eight times, really. Then I look at what I've got, I had up my phones, I had up my watches, I add up my tablets, and so on. It mounts very quickly. So, if you think about it, it's not that far-fetched. We're buying more and more devices, smart devices. If we're going to develop new ideas, we want to keep it simple. We may want to measure complex things, but we want to keep it as simple <coughs> as we can. Okay, and the adherence is basically, again, We've got to find better ways to do things, and our technologies will enable us to do that. And I see that there, as more and more people become connected, monitored, we need to be able to keep track of it. An example.